Welcome, Philosophy 1150 students, to the second of our video lectures. So, we're on assignment 11 still. Now we're going to move from part B to part D, the middle exercise. I've picked out a number of questions for us to do here. Let's start with the first one. Someone gets angry at everyone. So we've got the one place predicate, PX, X is a person. We've got the two place relation, AXY, X gets angry at Y. Okay, someone gets angry at everyone. There's at least one X such that X is a person and all Y are such that if Y is a person, then X gets angry at Y. So, notice that the existential quantifier paired with the bound X variable is ranging over a conjunction the universal quantifier paired with the bound y variable is ranging over a conditional. So there's no rule saying that existentials always have to be with conjunctions, universals with conditionals, but it is a very frequent pairing, frequent enough that it's worthwhile to be well aware of. All right. So we move on to question four. Some people like themselves, but some people do not like themselves. So we've got the one place predicate, PX, X is a person. The two place relation, LXY, X likes Y. So the sentence structure we've got here is a conjunction, and it's a conjunction of two sentences in quantificational logic, which we've seen before. So, the first conjunct, some people like themselves. There's at least one X such that X is a person and Ooh, a little bit too close in there. There's at least one person, at least one X such that X is a person and X likes X and the second conjunct is some people do not like themselves. There's at least one X such that X is a person and it's not the case that X likes X. So, a couple of things to note here. First of all, I hope you're familiar now with the reflexive relation. So, we have the bound X variable in both slots. The other thing to notice with this particular question is that I've used the bound x variable twice. I could have used the bound y variable for the second conjunct. It doesn't matter, and just to re-emphasize, it doesn't matter for the following reason. The first existential quantifier with the bound x variable only ranges over this conjunction, that's the first sentence immediately to the right of it. The second existential quantifier, also with a bound x variable, ranges over that other conjunction, the first sentence immediately to the right of it. So, because those two quantifiers don't have what's called an overlapping scope, 
some part of the sentence that they both apply to, you don't need to have different bound variable letters because there is no confusion that could arise. So we could have used um, a Y bound variable for the second conjunct, or as I've done, we could stick with the X. If we look back to the first question though, we do have a situation where the two quantifiers have an overlapping scope. So, the existential quantifier with the bound X variable ranges over the first sentence immediately to the right of it, but because of these brackets, the square ones, the first sentence immediately to the right of that existential quantifier with the bound X variable is the conjunction which consists of PX and this universally quantified conditional. Most importantly, the, the consequent of the universally quantified conditional has a two-place relation and part of that relation is being quantified over by the existential quantifier with the bound x variable. Part of it is being quantified over by the universal quantifier with the bound y variable. So it's essential that we have different bound variable letters for that situation. And in general, now that we're into quantificational logic, this kind of situation is more common than the kind of situation we see in question four. That being said, we move on to question seven. Everything is caused by something. Now, there's a little bit of a confusing situation that I want to clarify before I do questions 7 and 10. If you look at question 7, everything is caused by something or other. Notice the two-place relation they've given you. C, X, Y. X is caused by Y. So, in question 7, then, the two-place relation is defined in such a way that the inner slot, the one with the X, is the effect, whereas the outer slot is the cause. X is caused by Y. They do a little bit of a switch on us, though, when we get to question 10, because We've got this same um, construction, CXY, but notice the way in which it's defined is different in an important way. Instead of defining it X is caused by Y, it's defined as X causes Y. So in question 10, CXY is defined in such a way that the inner slot is the cause, and the outer slot is the effect. They do this to make the symbolization a little bit easier, but it's important to be aware of that. There is no right or wrong way to define a predicate or a relation. It's just important to be clear on what's being referred to in all of the slots you're considering. So, having clarified that, question 7. Everything is caused by something or other is going to be for all x there exists a y such that x is caused by y. When we move to question 10, nothing causes anything. Here, in question 10, the predicate has been defined a little bit differently, so that the innermost slot is the cause. We would symbolize it as it's not the case 
that there exists an x and there exists a y such that x causes y. Now, let's just consider, I'll call it question 7 star. Suppose we had question 7, the same English sentence, everything is caused by something or other, but instead of having the two-place relation defined as it is, cx, y, x is caused by y, it might have been defined as it is in question 10, cx, y, x causes y. That is to say, a situation where the innermost slot is the cause, the outermost slot is the effect. So, everything is caused by something would be all, for all y there exists an x such that c x y. So you note that we've got a different ordering of the quantifiers because the predicate is defined a little bit differently. Or you may have noticed this. Another way that we could have symbolized the English sentence in seven, everything is caused by something, if the two-place relation were defined as it is in 10, x causes y, where the innermost slot is the cause, the outermost slot is the effect, is we could have said, for all x, there exists a y such that y causes x. So notice the important thing is to line up the quantifiers in the way that the English sentence requires them to be. And it's sometimes very important to keep track of exactly what the relation is indicating, exactly how it's defined. We're going to come back to this sort of situation when we consider three-place relations a little bit later on. That being said, though, and recall that question 10, I'll just write that down again. So, here we've got then three different versions of question 7. The bottom two involve a situation where the two-place relation is defined a little bit differently, the same as it is in 10 here. So, question 10, nothing causes anything. It's not the case that there exists an x and there exists a y such that x causes y. Finally, on this board, anyway, we move on to 13. Every entity is either necessary or dependent on a necessary entity. So we've got the one place predicate, nx, x is necessary, and we've got the two place relation, dx, y, x is dependent on y. So the English sentence says, Every entity is either necessary or dependent on a necessary entity. All x are such that x is necessary or there exists a y such that 
y is necessary, and x is dependent on y. This is one of the few situations where we don't have the universal quantifier and the bound x variable paired with a conditional, but instead, in order to accurately characterize what's indicated by the English sentence, we've paired the universal quantifier with Sorry, we've paired the universal quantifier with a disjunction. So, that's question 13. Now we'll move over to questions 18, 19, and 20. 18 says the relation being to the north of is transitive. And they tell us that n x y x is to the north of y. So there are a number of relations that it's mathematically interesting to classify them in certain ways. And one of these is the transitive relation. So Here's how a transitive relation is set out. A transitive relation involves three universal quantifiers, all of which have a different bound variable. So, all x, all y, and all z are such that if x is north of y and y is north of z, then x is north of z. So, in English, any relation ending with the suffix er, richer, older, happier, would be a transitive relation. What would be an example of a non-transitive relation? Well, how about x is the uncle of y and y is the uncle of z? That wouldn't be a situation where x is the uncle of z. Instead, x would be perhaps the great uncle, but there'd be a whole range of situations where uh, this construction, which is the transitive construction, wouldn't hold. So, I'll also just note, there aren't going to be any questions on the exam where I say something like that. There are a couple of other relations, though, that just for knowledge's sake, we can go through. 19. The relation being next to is symmetrical. The symmetrical relation involves two universal quantifiers. All x and all y are such, and here we haven't seen this for a while, if all right, and we are back. So we're going to consider questions 14, 23, and 25 from part D of assignment 11. And the reason these are more complicated is they've got at least one occurrence of three-place relations. So, we'll start with 14. No logician argues about every subject with everyone. So, We've got the one place predicate, LX, X is a logician. One place predicate, SX, X is a subject. PX, X is a person. And we've got the three place relation, A, X, Y, Z. So,
Let's pause to make sure we're crystal clear on how the three-place relation works here. So you have to make sure you pay close attention to the way in which it's defined. X argues about Y with Z. X argues about Y with Z. So here we've got the innermost slot, we've got the middle slot, and we've got the outer slot. So, the innermost slot refers to, let's call it, the arguer. The middle slot refers to the subject being argued about, and the outermost slot refers to, let's call them, the arguee. That is to say, the person that is being argued with by the arguer in the innermost slot. All right. So, how do we symbolize question 14? Well, one thing to make things as easy as possible on ourselves, we will assume that the logician is a person and we won't indicate that. So, no logician argues about every subject with everyone. So, it's not the case that there exists an X such that X is a logician and all Y are such that If Y is a subject, then all Z are such that if Z is a person, then finally, here comes the three-place predicate. X argues about Y with Z. So, Notice all the lines we have. So, we start off with the negated existential quantifier. There is no logician that has a certain collection of properties, or there is no logician about whom certain descriptions can be given. So, these two square brackets go with the negated existential quantifier. Then we have the universal quantifier with the y-bound variable. These two square brackets go with that one. Finally, we have the round brackets that go with the universal with the z-bound variable. There is no x such that everything that's a subject, or let's put it in the more um, logical ease way of uh, describing it. It's not the case that there exists an X such that X is a logician and all Y are such that if Y is a subject then all Z are such that if Z is a person then X argues with about Y with Z. Notice I almost changed the way in which the predicate is defined. I was tempted to put it, as it sometimes is in books, all A, X, Y, Z would stand for X argues with Y about Z. That different um, 
definition of the relation would have the arguer in the innermost slot, but it would have the arguee in the middle slot and the subject in the outer slot. So, given that the three-place relation is defined in the way that it is, this is the correct symbolization. Okay, so now let's move to questions 23 and 25. And I will leave 24 for you, although hopefully before questions like this, pause the video, see how far you can get in symbolizing the question yourself from what you've learned on question 14 before you watch me symbolize it. Okay, question 23. Some philosopher studies every book with some teacher. So, we've got PX, X is a philosopher, BX, X is a book, TX, X is a teacher. Notice there's no person parts, but we've got the three-place relation S, X, Y, Z. X studies Y with Z. So, S, X, Y, Z stands for X studies Y with Z. So, once again, we've got the innermost slot, then we've got the middle slot, then we've got the outer slot. So, in this case, the innermost slot is going to be occupied by the philosopher. The middle slot is going to be occupied by what is studied, namely some book. And the outer slot is going to be occupied by the teacher. Okay, so now that we've got that straight, some philosopher studies every book with some teacher. Is that some philosopher or every philosopher? Some philosopher, or at least one philosopher, studies every book with at least one teacher. So, there's at least one X such that X is a philosopher and all Y are such that if Y is a book, then there's at least one Z such that Z is a teacher and here's where it all comes together. X studies Y with Z. Okay, so there's at least one X such that X is a philosopher and all Y are such that if Y is a book, then there's at least one Z who's a teacher and X studies Y, that book, with Z. Okay, so this is, I will admit, a little bit challenging. There aren't going to be a lot of questions like this on the exam, but there'll be one or two. So if you want to ace the exam, you need to 
think through and understand questions like these. But you certainly don't need to get questions like these perfect just to pass the exam. So that being said, let's consider the last question we're going to look at for Part D in Assignment 11, Question 25. No philosopher studies any book with any teacher. So, it's not the case that there exists an X such that X is a philosopher and there exists a Y such that Y is a book and there exists a Z such that Z is a teacher and X studies Y with Z. So notice we've got three existentially quantified sentences. The first one is negated and we've got all conjunctions. It's not the case that there exists an X such that X is a person and there exists a Y such that Y is a book and there exists a Z such that Z is a teacher and X studies Y with Z. The English sentence, no philosopher studies any book with any teacher. This particular one, here's an alternative um, way of symbolizing it that is about the same level of complexity using universal quantifiers. It would go like this. All X are such that if X is a philosopher, then all Y are such that if Y is a book, then all Z are such that if Z is a teacher, then, and here's where it comes, all comes together, but the other thing, notice, there is no negation here, so the negation finally comes. <clears throat> so, wouldn't you know it, the camera cut out just before I was finished. So, back to the alternative way of symbolizing question 25. All X are such that if X is a philosopher, then all Y are such that if Y is a book, then all Z are such that if Z is a teacher, then, and here's where the negation comes in, it's not the case in all of those instances that X studies Y with Z. That's another way of getting at the claim, no philosopher studies any book with any teacher. All right, while we're at it here, I'll fix up the other stopping of the video. So, back we go to questions 18, 19, and 20. So, the relation being to the north of is transitive, if you recall. All X, all Y, and all Z are such that if X is to the north of Y and Y is to the north of Z, then to the north of Z. And perhaps a better example of a non-transitive relation would be if all X, all Y, and all Z are such that if X is in love with Y, so imagine one person being in love with another person, and Y is in love with Z, then 
would it follow that X is in love with Z? Probably not, since X is in love with Y, and Y is spurning them because they're in love with Z. So there's a whole range of different non-transitive relations. But those that are transitive, like being to the north of, or being richer than, or being older than, can be symbolized using this standard sort of a template for the transitive relation. Now we move on to 19, and this is right around where the video cut out. The relation of being next to is symmetrical. So this one has two quantifiers, all x and all y are such that if x is next to y or x is next to y, if and only if y is next to x. So the biconditional then signifies the symmetrical relation. And finally, one we've seen before, the reflexive relation. Number 20. The relation being the same shape as is reflexive. So that would be all x are such that x has the same shape as x. So pretty much any relation that could be described in terms of is the same as is often a reflexive relation. All x are such that x is the same shape as x, x is the same size as x, x has the same mass as x, x has the same age as x, and so on. All right, so this ends our consideration of part D in assignment 11. So tomorrow I'll move on to part E, and that will be our third video, and those will be all the videos that are necessary to prepare you for the second part of the symbolizing uh, portion of the exam. So we've got, just to remind you, assignment 10, using the CP and IP rules in sentential logic, or sorry, assignment 9, Assignment 10, symbolization in predicate or one-place relation logic. And then finally, symbolization in multi-place relational logic. Okay, so if you have any questions, any concerns, email me. Otherwise, make sure you do all of the remaining questions in exercises 9, 10, and 11. And one week from today, minus approximately eight hours, that is to say next Wednesday morning, you will receive the exam in the email and you'll be required to deposit it in the Moodle page I'll give more detailed instructions of how to do that when I send the exams out.